Hi, everyone. So we are just going to wait a little bit um, to let people come into the workshop. So this is the Great River Report workshop on ever wonder how scientists ad identify dragonflies. So we're just going to give it about a minute and let people start to come in. All right. So I think we will get started as I see that the live stream is now up on Facebook and it is working. All right, so hi everyone. Welcome to this week's Great River Report workshop on ever wonder how scientists identify dragonflies. My name is Yannick Rozo and I work as a research assistant with the St. Lawrence River Institute and I will be your host for the evening. So this workshop is being held in partnership with Ottawa River Keepers and we are excited to have some of their youth water leaders joining us today. And before we begin the workshop, I would like to acknowledge that many of us are living on traditional land and unceded territory of Indigenous peoples. And I myself am currently located on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee. And as this is a virtual workshop, we may have participants joining us from various different locations. And so if you would like to know more about what territory you are living on, then I invite you to check out www native-land.ca. So for today's workshop, we will be speaking with Dr. Mary Ann Perrone, who is a MITAX postdoctoral fellow and who we are lucky to have working with us on the Great River Report. So a little bit about Dr. Perrone before we get started. She is a freshwater biologist with expertise in wetland ecosystems and urban ecology. She is originally from North Bay and has a Bachelor's of Science in Biology with a specialization in conservation and restoration ecology from Laurentian University. In 2020, she completed her PhD in biology, specializing in wetland ecosystems, entomology, and urban ecology from the University of Ottawa. She is a wetland scientist and an entomologist with research interest in wetlands odontology, which is the study of dragonflies and damselflies. Um, conservation biology and botany, among many, many others. So we are very excited and lucky to have her joining us today and speaking about dragonflies and damselflies and sharing tips on how to identify these invertebrates as well as how to properly catch and handle them. And so just to give you a quick breakdown of how the workshop will be happening today, Dr. Perron will be um, going through her slideshow for approximately 30 minutes. And then we will have a 15 minute question and answer period. And so throughout the workshop, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to drop them within the comment section of the Facebook Live video and we will make sure to get to them at the end. So now without further ado, here is Dr. Marianne Perot. Hi everyone. Thank you for coming to the workshop and thank you for everyone uh, for sending in their dragonfly photos. So today the workshop is going to consist of a bit of overview and, you know, some starting tips on how to identify dragonflies. And then we're going to go over all of the photos that everyone submitted and I'm going to identify the dragonflies and show you what to look for for those particular species. Okay, so the most basic starting point for dragonfly identification is to learn the difference between dragonflies and damselflies. So dragonflies are a suborder of Odonata. So Odonata is an order of insects divided into two suborders, the dragonflies and the damselflies. Uh, dragonflies are larger bodied. Uh, they hold their wings horizontally uh, when perched, whereas damselflies are more delicate, smaller bodies, and uh, most of them hold their wings together when perched. So these insects are uh, semi-aquatic, so they spend most of their life cycle actually in the water as nymphs. And these are pictures at the bottom of what a dragonfly nymph looks like and an example of what a damselfly nymph looks like. So they have a biphasic life cycle, which means that they spend part of their life in the water and then they emerge as an adult and spend another part of their life in the terrestrial environment. So dragonflies um, and damselflies from our region here in Cornwall spend anywhere from a few months to up to four years as nymphs living in the aquatic habitat. And then about, you know, anywhere from a couple weeks to a, a couple months as adults. So most of their life cycle is in the water. Um, 
this here is just a painting uh, from Brem in 1893. And it just shows you basically the dragonfly life cycle. So the nymphs live in the water, they curl up a piece of vegetation, emerge, and then spend their life as an adult looking for a mate, breeding, and then laying eggs and the life cycle continues. One of the other basic things that uh, starters sort of need to grasp when learning how to identify dragonflies is to learn the different flight periods. So each species has a flight period and not all species have the same flight period. So some species are early flyers and you'll only see them in the spring, whereas other species are late flyers and you'll see them you know, into the fall even. So learning all of these different flight periods is critical if you're tar trying to target certain species, for example. And this information usually is available at a local scale. So if you think about ecosystems up north, they're gonna have different flight periods, even for the same species as ecosystems more in the south because the climate is different. So when you have hotter temperatures, you're gonna have uh, emergence earlier on in the year than cooler temperatures. So I'm in Ottawa right now and the Ottawa uh, Field Naturalist Club has a great dragonfly checklist that gives you all these flight periods. And I invite all of you guys to go and check out to see if your local um, municipality has a dragonfly checklist and to see if you could get information on the species that are in your region. So basic anatomy that I'm gonna talk about today. So these are the sort of the vocabulary that uh, you need to be a bit familiar with. So when you look at a dragonfly and a damselfly, the two main parts of their body is the abdomen here. So basically sort of like the tail looking part of the dragonfly and then the thorax here. So this part is the thorax on a dragonfly. This is the abdomen. This is the thorax on a damselfly and this is the abdomen here. Other parts that you need to look at when identifying dragonflies is uh, their anal appendages. So at the tips of their tails, uh, they often have different appendages and lots of species require you to look at these appendages to be able to properly identify them. You have um, different, you know, patterns or different placements of eyes that will help you identify, as well as uh, looking at the genitalia of dragonflies and damselflies. So the primary genitalia is found um, at the tip of the abdomen and the secondary genitalia is found sort of at the beginning of the abdomen. So looking at these patterns with the hand lens will allow you to identify certain cryptic species that are harder to identify visually. Okay, I think this is the last basic here. So for all of you who wanna get started in uh, dragonfly identification and the proper term that we use uh, the slang is Odin. So if you wanna go out Odin, I think step one is to learn how to hold an Odinet. So there's two ways to properly hold an Odinet so you don't harm them. So once you catch them in your sweep net, uh, the first way that you can hold it is by pinching or scissoring their wings with your index and your middle finger, but make sure that you don't have any bug spray or sunscreen or anything on your finger that might damage uh, the insect. So have clean hands. You could scissor the wings closed, all four wings, and uh, make sure that you have all four wings or you can damage a wing if it's uh, left out. The second way, uh, once you get maybe a bit more experience is to pinch the thorax very gently. So you don't have to pinch hard, but gently pinch the thorax and this is the second way that you could hold a dragonfly without uh, causing harm. So some of the best field guides, and this differs basically uh, by region. My favorite field guide in the world is this one here, and this is the one that you're gonna see in some of the clips. So the uh, dragonflies and damselflies of Algonquin Park. This is a field guide by Colin Jones and his colleagues, and it's, it's there's no other field guide in our region that's as good as this one. I, I think this one is just, it's great for beginners and it's great for experts. It's overall the best one to get. You could get it at the Algonquin Park store um, and I think it's about $30. The other one that covers a larger geographic area is the Dragonflies and the Damselflies of the West by Dennis Paulson. 
this is also a really good field guide as well. So these are the two ones I would recommend if you want to get started in Odin. Uh, so I think we'll start with the damselflies. So as I mentioned, damselflies are generally smaller than dragonflies. They're more delicate. Uh, they hold their wings together when they're perching or at a 45 degree angle at the very most. So they don't hold their wings horizontally. Their wings are always behind their head. Uh, their eyes are also very far apart, which is something that's seen in damselflies and one group of dragonflies, but most dragonflies have their compound eyes are closer together. So the first clip that I'm going to show you is a clip of me catching an eastern forktail and identifying it using this guide. So this here is a female forktail. So you can see she's very blue. So this is an older female. When they're immature, they're actually orange. And uh, dragonflies and damselflies are mostly sexually dimorphic, which means that the males look different than the females. So this female here is a bluey gray color with green eyes. And we'll show you a picture of what the male looks like uh, in a bit. So basically um, the male is black with a blue and green, um, blue and green parts on his body. I'll show you a picture. And uh, this is probably the most common damselfly we have in the area. So this is the species we just caught. So it's the Eastern Fork Tail. And this is the female form that we just caught here. So she's blue gray with the green eyes. As I said, the immature female is orange. So she looks like this. The male is black on his abdomen with the tip of his abdomen blue and his thorax uh, is green. So this is, uh, as I said, one of the most common damselflies we have in the area. Okay, so I hope you all enjoyed that little clip and I hope that the technical, you know, it's sometimes challenging with this virtual world, but hopefully that all the tech uh, things are coming through clear for you guys. Uh, so that was a clip of me catching a female Eastern Forktail. Another important thing that makes Odin a little bit more difficult is that Odinets exhibit sexual dimorphism. What is sexual dimorphism? It's basically when animals, uh, depending on their sex, have different, basically, morphological traits. So it basically means that the males will look a lot different than the females. So for every species that you see, you basically have to learn at least two different color forms because two, the female and the male each have a different color form. So it does make Odin a bit tricky. Males are usually a lot easier to identify than females. So start with males. Uh, that's a good place to begin with. Uh, just to give you an idea of how many species. So in our area right now, uh, we have over 120 different Odinate species. So there are quite a few species and some of them are a lot trickier than others. But this is to give you an example. Um, this is the female Eastern Forktail, the one that you saw in uh, the clip. She also has an orange form when she's immature. So sh she actually has an orange thorax and a black abdomen. And when she matures, she develops this prunosity um, and becomes more of a gray blue color. The male looks completely different. It has a black abdomen. It has a blue tip on the abdomen and a green thorax. So this is just to give you an idea of sexual dimorphism in odonets, and pretty much all species have the sexual dimorphism. So you need to learn what the female looks like and you also need to learn what the male looks like. Next clip I'm gonna show you is the marsh bluette. So this is a very, very tricky group of damselflies to identify. And this clip is gonna give you just a brief overview on a bluette identification and how I got to the marsh bluette ID for this specimen. So this one here, this is a male and it's a male marsh bluette. And the way to identify these bluettes, so there's a lot of species that look exactly the same. So you have to look at the pattern of their caudal appendages right here. So you would look at that. So if you use your binoculars upside down, it works as a hand lens and you would look at it, look at its pattern and you could identify the species. This is what you use to identify the bluette. So all those little blue damselflies you see, we have about 
I don't know, over 15 species or 15 species that look exactly the same. So you need to catch those ones to identify them. So that was a marsh bluette. So this is the pattern of the caudal appendages of the marsh bluette. So you have this one sort of hook here, and then you have uh, a part that goes upwards. So that's what we had right there. So the marsh bluette is one of the more common bluettes, and you can find it in a bunch of different habitats. So wetlands, uh, streams, etc. cetera. Um, but as I mentioned, there's a lot of bluettes and they all pretty much look exactly the same. I would say that the bluettes are the hardest group of odonets to identify. You basically have to catch them almost every time. Look at the, those caudal appendages, look at that pattern uh, to be able to accurately identify the bluettes. And that is just for males. So the females, uh, they have like an extra challenge. They don't have those patterns. Uh, you know, those uh, primary genitalia at the end of their um, abdomen. So you have to look at the, their mesostigmal plates, which is basically like their shoulders. So the females are a lot harder to identify. The male bluettes are, are hard too. So it's good to practice those ones, um, but it takes some time to learn all the bluettes. This here is another bluette, but it's not one that's all blue, like the one we saw in the clip. So this one is called the rainbow bluette. Uh, this is Analegma antenatum. And to be able to identify this bluette, um, it's usually found in rivers the most, but it can also be found in smaller streams and ponds. Uh, I basically, the first thing I look at is, I look for these yellow legs. So there are other, uh, bluettes that have these yellow legs, but that's my first step to see if the bluette has yellow legs. And if it does, it's possibly the rainbow bluette. I then look for this yellow shoulder strip and the orange eyes. And, and basically, as you could tell, this one is just a bunch of different colors. I think it's our most colorful bluette around here. Um, it's always a delight to see. It's very, um, I would say it's very shy and it gets scared easily. It doesn't really sit in one place for long. So it'll be flying, it'll perch for about a second and then it will you know, leave its perch and keep flying again. So it's actually pretty hard to take uh, pictures of this one. So the next clip uh, and the last damselfly clip I'm gonna show you is me catching a sedge sprite. So a sedge sprite is a damselfly and it's the most delicate damselfly that we have in the area. It's also a very common damselfly and it can be found in a range of different habitats as well. So it's uh, found in wetlands and you know, along river edges and lake edges as well as I've seen it. So roll the clip. So I caught a damselfly and I'm not sure if you guys know what the difference is between dragonflies and damselflies, but damselflies are much smaller. I'll take them out of my net. So there's, they're very fragile, so you have to be very careful how you hold them. This is a sedge sprite, a male. So you know it's a male because this species has the blue tip. So it has some prunosity on the tip of its abdomen and the female doesn't have that. The female has more of a yellow color than a blue color. And damselflies are much smaller and hold their wings closed like this. So this is the species that we found here, the sedge sprite, Nihalania irene, and we saw the male here. So you see that the male has more blue on him and the female has more yellow. So the, those uh, damselflies were all caught in Cooper Marsh. Um, it's a nice place to go look for odonets. We saw a lot of species that day. Uh, now we're gonna get to our first viewer submission. So this is a photo by Jennifer and uh, it's a photo actually of two damselflies here. So these two damselflies, uh, what you notice first about these two are that they have completely, you know, darkly pigmented wings. So that's your first hint at what species this is. So in this photo, this is actually a really interesting photo. Uh, we have our male here 
and we have the female here and to be able to distinguish between the male and the female of the species which the species is called the ebony jewel wing so it's a species that's found along streams and rivers. And it's my favorite damselfly species because it's this metallic green color and it just, it looks beautiful um, when it's flying around. So the male here is actually defending his female here. Uh, and you could see the female sort of, uh, her abdomen is bent in the water. She's actually laying eggs inside of this plant here. So she, damselflies and one group of dragonflies, the darners have a specialized ovipositor which is basically a structure used to cut little slits in plants and deposit their eggs inside of plant tissues. So you could actually see the female doing that in this picture, which is pretty neat. So she has her abdomen bent, she's cutting slits in this plant, and she's laying her eggs in this plant. And the male is defending her to make sure that, you know, no, nobody bothers her while she lays her eggs. So thank you, Jennifer, for this, uh, for this, this picture here. So we have two jewel wings in the area and uh, they're pretty easy to identify between or distinguish between the two. So we have the ebony jewel wing, which is the jewel wing that you saw in the previous slide. So this jewel wing has completely dark pigmented wings, whereas the river jewel wing, the other jewel wing that we have in the area, um, the wings are not completely pigmented. It looks like the wings were dipped, the tips were dipped in black ink basically. And these two species are often found together. So you have the river jewel wing and the ebony jewel wing. The river jewel wing is actually, I find as a stronger flyer than the ebony jewel wing, but you, you will see both species together on large rivers or small streams. So now we're gonna get to our dragonflies. So we got a lot more viewer submissions of dragonfly photos and damselfly photos. Um, dragonflies are, they're larger, they're easier to see. They're super strong flyers. Um, they hold their wings horizontally when perched and uh, their eyes sort of meet in the center of their face besides the club tails where the club tails eyes are a little bit more separated, a little bit more resembling the placement as damselflies, but they are larger bodied. So it's, it's easy to distinguish them um, to damselflies. So this is a viewer submission by Philip. Uh, this is a group of darners. So this is the Ishnide family. These are hard to identify by picture. So I had to do a little bit of research for these, but what I came up with, um, basically when you look at these darners, this is a male. And to identify the males, you need to look at the male claspers. So basically sort of the structures that are projecting from the tip of its abdomen. So I tried to get a close up of this male clasper and the pattern of this clasper lines up with the lake darner. And also this uh, picture, the specimen has dark blue thoracic uh, stripes. So it's like a deep blue and the first thoracic stripe is notched. So I'm pretty confident to say that this one is a lake darner. Another darner picture that came in I can't tell you for sure what this species is. It's a little bit of a tricky one, but I got it basically um, down to two different species. So it's either the Canada darner, Ishna canadensis, or it's the lance tip darner, uh, Ishna constricta. And I'm leaning towards constricta. Um, this pattern here, it's hard to see, but I'm pretty sure there's a small point at the bottom of it, which is telling me that this one is, um, Sorry, this one is um, the lance tip darner, but I can't be 100% sure on that. I would say I'm 75% sure. Uh, this one too, because I can't see its last segment, I can't tell you if it's either a black tip darner or a Canada darner because they're, they're pretty similar. Um, but I bet you guys could tell me what this one is doing now that we saw the ebony jewel wing. Um, this is the only family of dragonflies that actually are endophytic ovipositors, which means that they have this specialized ovipositor to cut slits in plants, lay eggs inside of plants. This is the only family that does this, and this dragonfly is super confused. So you could see the abdomen sort of bend here, and you see its ovipositor against the strap of a school bag. So this dragonfly has some kind of maladaptive, you know, selection, OB position site selection mechanism. So something 
uh, basically it's visual cues are telling the dragonfly that this is a good place to lay its eggs. But in fact, it's not a very good place to lay uh, his eggs. And these eggs probably won't survive because they don't have any type of, you know, water um, to hatch in. So now let's move on to another group of dragonflies. So we're gonna move on to the skimmers. Uh, this dragonfly here, this is a very common species that we have in the area. And I'm sure if you guys have looked, you've seen the species before. So the two main things that you need to identify the species is the yellow dot on its seventh segment. So the yellow dot here, it's the only species that has this big yellow dot in the area and it's white face. And he has the perfect name. He's a dot-tailed white face. So his, his name says it all. Basically just look for this dot, this gleaming white face, and you know uh, that you have Lucrina intacta. So the dot-tailed white face. And even if you can't see its face, um, as long as you see this yellow dot, you're, you could be pretty confident that you have a male dot-tailed white face. So thank you so much, Monica and Lexi, for these uh, photo submissions. So the next uh, photo submission that we got by Monica again, and Monica's photos are really beautiful. So thank you if you're watching. Thank you so much for these submissions. Uh, this species is another very common one, and it's one that I'm sure all of you guys have seen before. It's called the widow skimmer. So Libellula lectuosa. And to be able to identify the species, look for the white bands on the outside and the dark bands on the inside. So this is a super common one. Um, the next picture is a little bit more blurry, but you can still see these white bands on the outside and the dark bands on the inside. So that's your widow skimmer. This one is, you know, it's a habitat generalist. It's found and I've seen it in rivers, I've seen it in ponds. Um, it could be found in a lot of different places. It does like uh, more densely vegetated spaces because it's a percher. So a percher, basically dragonflies are either flyers or perchers. Flyers are gonna be flying most of the time. Perchers are gonna be perched on something most of the time. So this species here is a percher. So if you wanna get a good photo of it, find a perch and just be patient. Just wait there and it will fly around and go to the same perch almost every time. So that's a, just a little trick to get a good picture of perchers. Find its perch. This is another percher here. Um, this is a photo by Kate. So thank you, Kate, for your submission. And basically, this is a female. So she does look a lot different than uh, the male. It's a common white tail. So the, the male actually has Sorry about that. The male actually has a white prunosity on its abdomen. So all of its abdomen is pretty much very bright white and its wings has uh, dark black bands on it. So one dark black band. The female has sort of these pigmented wings. So it has all the tips of its wings are pigmented as well as spots throughout the rest of its wing. It also has this white dash line. So this white dashed line that goes on the sides of its abdomen. A species that it's easily confused with, um, I still have to do some double takes for this one, is Libellula pulchella, so the 12 spotted skimmer. So this is, a, the females and the immature males often look the same, but if you look at the females of these two, you have the white dashed line for the common white tail, but you have a solid yellow line for uh, the 12 spotted skimmer. So if you see this solid yellow line, you know it's a 12 spotted skimmer. If there's, you know, if it's a dash line, that's your common white tail. So the next one uh, is a picture by Monica. Thank you for this submission. This is my second favorite dragonfly um, that I know of. <laughs> uh, it's a calico pennant. So this is another species of skimmers. It's also a percher. You could see this lovely male perched on a plant here. What you're looking for is uh, the males are red. The females look the same, but they're yellow. You're looking for basically a large pale centered, a large pale centered dark patch uh, at the base of its hind wing and spots on the rest of its wing. I'm gonna show you the next picture that's gonna make that a little bit more clear. So this is the calico pennant here on the left side of this slide. 
uh, it's it's really a cute dragonfly, a beautiful dragonfly. It has these little hearts that go down its abdomen. So you, you have your uh, yellow form and your red form here. And you're looking for basically this little pale heart, <laughs> the pine wing. So that's your calico pennant. It's a beautiful dragonfly. It's not super common. So when you do see one, uh, you should feel lucky to see it. Uh, one of the species, though, that do uh, that the calico pennant does get mistaken for sometimes is the Halloween pennant. So Celithemus aponina, they're from the same genus. So they're both from the Celithemus genus, um, which means that they're actually pretty close genetically. But the difference uh, morphologically between these two species is we don't have those hearts on its abdomen for the Halloween pennant. And instead of spots on the wings, you have bands. So the pigmentation goes from the top to the bottom of the wings. So that's the difference between these two species. Now we're gonna show you a clip of me catching an Eastern pond hawk, which is another type of skimmer. Okay, so this here, this is actually an immature male Eastern pond hawk. And when he gets older, he's gonna get prunosity here. So he's gonna still have thorax, have a blue abdomen. The female looks the same as this. Okay, so we found, um, we caught an immature male. So this is what the male looks like when he's mature. So as I mentioned, he's going to keep some of the green on his thorax and then get prunosity on his abdomen. So it's going to be blue. Um, the females look the same as the immature males. And the reason, uh, well, to sex a uh, dragonfly, you look for the secondary genitalia here. So if you see this, you know that it's, um, you know that this is going to be a male. So just like you saw in that clip, um, in the field guide, the Eastern pond hawk has two different color forms as well. So this is a picture of a mature male. This is a picture of the immature male, but the immature male looks exactly like the female looks. So these are the only two sort of color forms that you need to learn. Uh, this is a very common species. It's also a very territorial species. Um, it likes to perch again. Uh, you could see that the immature male, so when it's fresh out of its exuviae, so when it emerges from a nymph into an adult, it has this green form here. It often keeps green on its thorax, but the abdomen develops prunosity. So prunosity is basically this blue gray color that you see in dragonflies and that develops with time. So when you see a very mature dragonfly, you're gonna have a lot of prunosity. So it's gonna have a deep blue gray color. So the female also looks like this. This is an immature male. Uh, cause you can see the claspers at the end here. Uh, but this is just an example of different forms, color forms of the same species. This is a viewer submission photo from Philip. This one got me. I am not super sure what uh, this one is. I believe it's from the genus Sympetrum. Could be an autumn meadowhawk. I am not sure though. I don't know for sure what it is. Uh, the behavior of it looks like a meadowhawk because meadowhawks are super friendly. They're curious. They'll come and land right on you. So based on the behavior, it might be a meadowhawk, but I'm, I'm not super sure with this one. The lighting's not uh, telling me, you know, what I need to see with identification, but it looks maybe like some petrum, but good, good image, Phil. Um, this one definitely has me a little bit stumped, which is not super common, so that, that's a good one. Uh, here's another uh, photo from Monica. So this is a beautiful red dragonfly. It's a meadowhawk, so it's from the Sympetrum uh, genus as well. It's called the white-faced meadowhawk, Sympetrum obtrusum. And basically what you need to look for in this species, um, if you want to, basically any red dragonfly besides the calico pennant, there's a good ch chance that it's probably from uh, the Sympetrum or the meadow, it's one of the meadowhawks. Uh, there's three different meadowhawks in the region that look really similar. Uh, there's the cherry-faced meadowhawk, the white-faced meadowhawk, and then the ruby meadowhawk. 
and they all look really similar except the white face metal hawk has this gleaming white face so the the face is just super bright white where the other ones are a little bit more washed out so the white white face on this dragonfly is telling me that it's a white face metal hawk so look for the red body the white face and the black triangles on its abdomen thank you monica for the submission this is a beautiful photo this is another white face metal hawk i think I see its little white face shining through here. So, uh, and you see the black triangles on its abdomen. So this is a, a photo by Phil. So thank you, Phil. I think this is another white face metal hawk. And the white face metal hawk, as you know, all dragonflies uh, or most of them that I've mentioned has the sexual dimorphism as well. So the males look like this, the red with the you know white face, but the females look, they have these black triangles, but but they're more like a browny yellow color. Um, so they're a little bit harder to identify. Um, a lot of times I have to catch the females and look at the patterns of their genitalia to be able to identify them. So that's it for the dragonfly uh, workshop. Thank you so much for the pictures that have come in. Uh, if you have any pictures handy now, you could put them in the chat box. Um, and I could help you identify them. But if you're interested in looking at more Odonata photos, you can follow my Instagram at m.c.peron. Um, if you need any help with Dragonfly ID, send me your photo. I'd love to see them and I, love, I would love to help you identify them. If you're interested in learning more about Dragonflies or have any questions that you don't think of now, feel free to reach out to me and send me an email. But if you have any dragonfly questions whatsoever, please put them in the chat box and I'll do my best to uh, give you a good answer. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Marianne. That was awesome. That was a great presentation. Um, so yes, so now we will wait for to see if any comments come in to the chat box. Okay, so there is a question from Philip. It says, how does the conver conversion from nymph to dragonfly work? That's a great question, Phil. And thanks for sending in your photos. I was really happy to uh, receive your submission. So basically, uh, a nymph, so as I mentioned, the nymphs have, most of the life cycle is spent as a nymph in the aquatic environment. So there's some dragonflies in this region that spend four years in the water before they emerge. So they spend most of their life cycle in the water. They go through about 10 different molts. So they shed their skins about 10 different times, but they still look like a nymph. So it's basically the nymph will grow, it'll burst its outer shell, grow, grow, grow until it reaches its last instar. And when it reaches its last instar as a nymph, so that's the biggest version of the nymph that you're gonna see. It waits for some in, some different environmental cues and every species is different. So that's why we have these earlier flyers and these later flyers because they have different environmental cues. So maybe the earlier species needs a water temperature that's colder than the late flying species which require a hotter temperature as that cue to emerge. And when one species, basically a lot of the time the species will all emerge together. So all the meadow hawks will come out all the darners will come out um, depending on the different species. So when they get that cue to, you know, they're at their last instar, it's time to get out of the water. They need a vertical substrate. There is a few exceptions of species that can, you know, emerge on a horizontal substrate, but they need that vertical substrate to emerge from their nymph into the, their adult stage. So that's why emergent plants are so important for dragonflies and damselflies, not only because some of them actually lay their eggs in plants, but because they need that vertical substrate, that, that vertical angle to basically hold onto the plant and emerge. Um, they break their exoskeleton open. The adult comes out. The adult takes a bit of time to pump fluids through its body. There's some nice pictures of this on my Instagram actually. Um, and then pumps fluids into its wings, bats its wings, and then the adult is off. So that's sort of the process of it. Um, I hope that helped answer your question. Great. So we have another question from Philip. Um, it says, how long does it take to change forms? So it takes every, 
species is different. I think that the larger species probably take more time. So damselflies probably have a quicker emergence than dragonflies. Um, I actually got the chance to watch a dragon hunter, I actually watched several dragon hunters emerge. So dragon hunter is one of the biggest species of dragonflies that we have in our region. It's a species that takes four years, about four years in the water. Um, that, I basically sat and watched that and a lot of the emergence will happen earlier in the morning. And it, I, I could probably be confident to tell you that it takes maybe an hour, maybe a bit longer than an hour for the nymph to climb up the vegetation, get ready to break its shell, break its shell, get, you know, remove the exuviae from its body so the shell is left behind. And then for the adult to pump fluids through its body and then to pump its wings and fly away. I would say anywhere from like an hour, maybe to two hours, um, somewhere around there, I would say. Okay, great. We have one other question. So what book slash guide were you using to identify in the video clips or any, oh, sorry, or any book slash guides you like? Okay, this, this is like, if you, I don't know where you're from, but even if you're not from the Algonquin Park region, this is still the book I would recommend. So this is the one that you could buy. At, you could buy it online at um, the Algonquin Park website, and it's about thirty dollars. So it's it's pretty affordable, and the money you know goes to the Friends of Algonquin Park. And this book is the best field guide I've ever used. Um, it just has so much knowledge in this book. It's a book I use to learn. So it's you know it's even a good beginner's guide. You just, if you're not from the Algonquin Park region, just keep in mind that there might be some species that you see that aren't in this guide. So if you find one that doesn't match up with any of the dragonflies in this guide, then you might have to do a little bit of more research or send the picture to me and I could help you identify it. But just to give you an idea of like, they have all sketches of all the different patterns of the bluettes, and it basically has this for all the hard groups to identify. So it makes dragonfly identification easy as adults. You could also use Dennis, uh, Dennis Paulson's book. He is fantastic. And he covers all of the dragonflies of the Western hemisphere. So that's a bigger guide with more species. And it might be harder because there's more species that, you know, some species that might not be around here. So there's a lot more work to do to narrow it down. But this this is the one I would recommend and just keep in mind that if you're not from the Algonquin Park region, there might be species that aren't in here, but you could send them to me and I could help you out. Great. And maybe just to make sure that you got the name, um, we can make sure to put it in the comments after the after the video. For sure. Yeah. It's by Colin Jones, this one. And a few other people, Andrea Kingsley, Peter Burke, Matt Holder. The Dragonflies and Damselflies of Algonquin Park and Surrounding Area is the name of it. But we'll put, we'll make sure to post a link for it. <laughs> I'm just checking to see if there are any other questions. So I actually have a question um, just while we're waiting if any of other ones come in. Um, when you had mentioned that damselflies lay their eggs inside of like inside of plants, is there a certain species of plant that they prefer? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. And I think it's our area that needs more research. So there are some classic ecological papers that have, you know, found some different species. Like the, the example that comes to mind is uh, Leslie. So the spread wing damselflies seem to like scurpus species and spread wings can act actually lay their eggs in temporary temporary ponds. So ponds that dry out in the summer and then are filled back up in the spring. So scurpus might offer lots of protection for those eggs and make sure that they don't dry out. Um, so when you know the water comes back to the pond in the spring, they hatch, they actually overwinter in the plant. And then for that species, and they hatch in the spring when there's water in the pond. Um, there's, you know, there are certain plant traits, I think, that damselflies and the darners probably prefer. So they probably don't like like thick cuticles, plant cuticles, so like easy enough to put a slit into it. So there's different traits um, that can be uh, useful for dragonfly egg laying. A very cool thing that I saw this summer, and I'm not sure that 
uh, if you guys know this, but adult damselflies actually dive under the water to lay their eggs at the bottom of plant stems. So I caught, um, actually I have a video of it, of a damselfly, a male and a female in tandem, they dove in the water. They were found maybe like three inches under the water and the female was cutting slits in the bottom of the plant stems and laying her eggs. And she, I timed it. She stayed under there for eight minutes. And there's, you know, documentation of, of damsel, adult damselflies staying underwater for close to an hour or even more in some species. So, you know, I think it's just incredible. The reason why they do that is because uh, there might be some fluctuations in water level. So if you're getting, you know, you're laying your eggs in the base of those stems, you're pretty much maximizing the potential for those eggs to be underwater all year long. Just a, a cool side note. Ah, so interesting. I didn't know that. I'm not seeing any other questions. And we are at the 45 minute mark or so. Um, so if we don't have any more questions coming in in the next little bit, we may conclude the workshop for the evening. All right, there are no more questions. Well, with that then, um, just a big thank you to Marianne. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really informative and I'm already looking forward to the next time I get to go out and go out with you and identify some, some dragonflies and damselflies. Um, thank you to Zach, of course, as always, for everything you're doing behind the scenes to make sure that everything is running smoothly. And to everyone for tuning in tonight, we really appreciate it and we hope that you uh, you're able to learn something and as you joined along. So thanks everyone and we'll see you next time.